to begin by thanking Carol for inviting us to come and speak to you. And I also want to thank you, the audience, for coming out to hear us. I hope that those who are interested will be able to hear most of the, of the debate or to watch most of the ball game, wherever your interest may lie. But first, what we're going to do is talk about our book, The Archaeology of American Cities. Cities are the object of great interest in the United States today. Adam Gopnik recently had a review essay in The New Yorker, some of you may have read it, which covered over a half a dozen books on cities, most of which were new books. There is also that new Dickensian novel of New York in the 70s, City on Fire, by Garth Risk Kahlberg, which has received so much attention in the media uh, lately. We like to think our book is making a small contribution to this larger literature. But it is ironic that despite all this interest in cities, we really have no completely satisfactory definition of what a city is. Some definitions rely on criteria that can be quantified, such as size or population density, while others rely on characteristics that are qualitative, such as permanence and heterogeneity. But one can always come up with exceptions to these definitions. I have to say that my personal favorite was one offered by Brendan Behan in reference to New York, which he described as, quote, a place where you are least likely to be bitten by a goat. <laughs> As you know, there are two of us. I'm going to begin, and then after about 20 minutes, Nan is going to take over. And finally, we'll have time for questions and discussion, or do we want to do sure. that along the way? What, whatever you want. I, Why I think at the end. OK, the end. OK, very good. I'm going to start talk by talking about the genesis of the book, how the book came to be. And then I'm going to talk briefly about the history of urban archaeology in the United States. And finally, I'm going to talk about what I think is particularly important about the field. The story of this book began almost a decade ago when our, co our colleague Mike Massini, the editor of the University of Florida Press's series on the American experience and archaeological perspective, asked Nan if she would like to write a book about the archaeology of America's modern cities. I'm afraid that when she told me about her offer, I horned in and said, oh, let's do it. That would be fun. <laughs> Although Nan had not actually invited me to work with her. <laughs> However, she kindly took me on board. I hope she hasn't regretted her generosity. <laughs> and it was fun. Now, I don't think either of us realized how long it would take to complete. Uh, we thought it was appropriate that we did the book together because we had been at the forefront of urban archaeology in the United States when we directed the excavations at the Stathouse Block, AKA 85 Broad Street, in 1979-80 almost 40 years ago. And we were dying to find out what other archaeologists digging in other American cities had discovered in the meantime. But that was not easy. In addition to the usual tribulations of trying to organize vast quantities of material into a meaningful narrative, one of the hardest things we had to confront in doing this book was finding out about the archaeological project that had taken place in other parts of the country. We pretty much knew what was going on in New York City, and even in the Northeast. But the Midwest and the West were both unknown territory. Although sometimes people give reports on their projects at professional meetings, for the most part, information about these excavations is not published, but forms part of the gray literature, reports that languish on the shelves of bureaucrats. We had to call on our colleagues for help in finding out about these projects. The main way we did this was by putting out pleas for help on one of the archaeological listservs, HISTAR, and many of our colleagues responded. But even so, after the book was published, some people complained that we had not included their city in our discussion. <laughs> Unfortunately, however, if no one responded to our plea, we had no way of finding out that a project had actually taken place. The archaeology of modern cities is a relatively new field. Archaeologists have always been interested in cities, but traditionally they focus on ancient ones like Teotihuacan in Mexico or Ur in Iraq. Most of these are cities that were abandoned long ago and are not located in thriving metropolises today. The speaker. <laughs> the other speaker. And even when archaeologists do look at a modern city, they usually look at that city's ancient past, like Rome and London. It is only within the past 40 or 50 years or so that archaeologists have become interested in studying the relatively recent history of modern cities in their own right. And that is true for several reasons. 
First of all, most archaeologists thought that archaeological sites could not survive the building and rebuilding that characterizes modern cities. For example, it was hard to imagine an archaeological site like the Scott House block being preserved in the Wall Street District, the land of skyscrapers. And that's an overview of the Scott House block. Are people familiar where 85 Broad Street is, the corner of Broad Street and Pearl Street? And just across the street from Francis Tavern. And you can really, of course, see the urban environment, even though this obviously was a long time ago that that, that photo was taken. Second of all, archaeologists had no reason to want to dig in cities. They were not interested in asking questions that could be answered by studying them. Before the 1960s, archaeologists who studied the post-Columbian past were predominantly interested in using their excavations to find out information that could be used in documenting and interpreting historic houses and other structures. Thirdly, there was the issue, of course, of money. It can be very expensive to excavate in cities. Sites might be buried under tens of feet of landfill and the basements of modern buildings, and in order to excavate them, this overburden has to be removed. That involved the use of heavy machinery, such as backhoes and front-end loaders, as well as dump trucks to cart the debris away. Removing this detritus can be very expensive. In addition, the sheer population density of cities results in the intensification of land use, and that means urban archaeological sites can be very complex to excavate, again, an expensive undertaking, and result in much larger archaeological collections that have to be interpreted and curated, much more so than those generated by rural sites, and that too makes urban excavations more expensive. But in the 1960s and 70s, these obstacles to urban archaeology began to be removed. First of all, archaeologists learned from National Park Service excavations in Philadelphia that sites could be preserved in the most unlikely places. There, in downtown Philadelphia, they discovered the foundation wall from Benjamin Franklin's house and the shaft from his necessary or outhouse chock full of objects that had been used in the Franklin home. Secondly, the social ferment of the 60s and 70s had a profound effect on American culture as new ideologies that gave rise to the civil rights, women's, and environmental movements inspired academics, including archaeologists, to redefine and expand their research questions to include people who lived in urban areas. The poor and the working class, members of minority groups, and women, for example, in other words, there was now a reason to excavate in cities. Finally, there was the issue of money to pay for these expensive excavations. The environmental legislation that was passed in the 1960s and 70s took care of that. Beginning with the Federal Historic Preservation Act of 1966, acts and regulations were passed on the federal, state, and local levels that required that whenever there was government involvement in a development project, whether it was in funding, or merely granting a permit, the project came under environmental review. And one of the sets of resources that was considered in that review was archaeological sites. If the proposed development would destroy an important archaeological site, the impact of that project on the site would have to be mitigated, quote unquote, either by moving the project like a pipeline or excavating the site. Furthermore, these, regula these regulations usually require that the developer, whether a private entity or a government agency, pay for the archaeological study. Since the enactment of these regulations, there have been tens of thousands of archaeological products mandated in the U.S., and many of these have been in, your, in urban areas. In fact, most urban excavations have been mandated by the government, leading to the development of the field of contract archaeology, which you referred to in the introduction. We think that urban archaeology provides a unique contribution to the study of cities. First of all, it examines them at different scales. It takes both a macro view and a micro view of the city, as well as views that are in between. It can look on the whole city as an artifact in its own right, as you can see in comparing these maps of New York showing how it grew between 1720 and 1840. And I think a good way to sort of uh, uh, 
<laughs> locate yourself on this is this label the common I'm sure you probably can't read it the city hall park today's city hall park and then over here on the 1840s map city hall park. <laughs> So you can see massive growth just in that 120 years. And on the micro level, we can link artifacts to individual households to gain insight into family life. For example, these dishes, a plate, and children's mugs all belong to the Robeson family, who lived on Washington Square in the mid-19th century. <clears throat> Additionally, urban archaeology does not just use written records to explore the past, it also uses material culture. Things like the dishes or the city itself that have been made or modified by people to examine it. But in addition to these differences of scale, the mere fact of excavating an archaeological site focuses attention on the people whose activities formed it. Let me give an example of how this factor works. By looking at the African burial ground here in downtown Man Manhattan, which was excavated in 1991-92, this to me is the most important site that has ever been discovered in any American city. It began like any other archeological project mandated by government regulations. In the 1980s, the federal government began to make plans to build an office tower in lower Manhattan at 295 Broadway. Because this was a federal project, the uh, plans underwent environmental review. A small archaeological firm was hired to conduct the first part of the project, to conduct historical research to find out about the history of the parcel, and also to determine the likelihood that an important archaeological site remained on the block. To document the history of the property, the archaeologists consulted all sorts of records, including maps, tax records, city directories, They discovered that the site had been an African burial ground in the 18th century map. And this is our reference point, so we know where we are. Uh, it's City Hall Park. And this is a palisade for the northern, uh, you know, uh, keeping out people who might be attacking from the northern part of the island. And I think at this point, we're, we would be worried about the French. Correct. So that, and right outside that palisade is an area that's marked off on the map, and it says Negro's burial ground. And that's Collect Pond. And that's, uh, yeah, that's Collect Pond, exactly right, which is later filled in. <coughs> so the archaeologists discovered that the site had been an African burial ground in the 18th century. This was where the city's large population of enslaved Africans buried their dead. Then, the archaeologists looked at building records to check out the depths of the basements of the buildings that had, been, that had been there. They learned that in the area of the cemetery, the buildings had had very deep basements, over 20 feet deep, double basements in many cases. The archaeologists therefore inferred that the basements of the buildings had destroyed the burial ground except perhaps in one place where there had been a little alley between some of the buildings. So when they went into the field for testing to see what actually was left on the block, they expected this, that the cemetery was uh, gone. But they discovered an amazing thing. They could see burials appe appearing at a depth below the basements of the nearby buildings. The burials had not been destroyed by the construction of the recent buildings, and they realized they had missed something important in their research that had to do with the 18th century landscape. At the end of the 18th century, and I have a schematic that the overseeing archaeologist of this project made, uh, at the end of the 18th century, after the burial ground was abandoned, but before the block was developed, 20 to 25 feet of landfill was added to the cemetery to bring Broadway in that area up to the grade where it is today. In other words, today's Broadway, north of Chambers Street, had in the 18th century descended down to low-lying ground, and the cemetery was on that low-lying ground. What that meant was that the cemetery had been preserved under the 20 feet of late 18th century landfill and under the basement floors of the 19th and early 20th century buildings that had subsequently been built on the block. <coughs> 
Let me just, uh, this is, as I said before, is a schematic drawing. And way at the top, which I can't quite reach, that dark black line is the black top. Like it? Uh, uh, this, is a, this site had been a, uh, a parking lot, which is often a hold pattern for real estate, uh, because you can generate enough money from the parking lot to pay the taxes on, on the parcel while you're waiting to build. So that was the back lot, uh, the, the, uh, the black top. Underneath that is the picture of the basement of the building, the side view. This is like a layer cake cut away. We call it in our archaeological trade a profile. In England, in England, they call it a section. <laughs> but but you know, it's basically the same thing. And then under the basement floor of that building, some, in some cases the basement floors were deeper, there were remains of other things. This is a shaft from a privy or house. Uh, that had been uh, that had been used there before the 19th and 20th century buildings were built. In other words, in the late 18th century, walls from other structures. And then down here, you can see this was the uh, the ground surface in the 18th century, which was visible. Uh, you know, had been preserved in some places. Uh, and beneath that ground surface, obviously, were the burials. So you see if. if uh, how, how it was that it was preserved. And I think you can also see how easy it would be not to appreciate initially that there had been all of this landfill had added in that area. The archeologists worked in the fields in the summer of 1991 to the summer of 1992. They excavated over 400 burials. And this was just on a tiny part of where the cemetery had been. I think they looked on it as one sixth of the area. I seem to remember hearing that figure. Uh, during that time, protests were building, and some of you may remember this, among members of the city's African-American community. Some were deeply offended that they had not been dis uh, consulted on the disposition of the cemetery. And some felt that their ancestors, whether real or metaphorical, who had been oppressed in life, were being abused in death as well. They wanted the excavations to stop. Finally, in 1992, they were successful. The excavation was stopped, and the 400 burials were sent to Howard University, an historically black college, to be analyzed by a team led by a physical anthropologist there. The analyses documented the extreme hardships that enslaved Africans in, uh, endured during their captivity in New York and read our book to find out more about the results of this really <laughs> exciting project. Uh, and 10 years later, the burials were reinterred in the site with great ceremony. Now, I just want to explain these a little bit. As I showed you in the schematic drawing, in some areas, not many, but in some areas, uh, the remains of the old ground surface, what had been the surface of the ground in that area in the, uh, before the 1790s was intact. It hadn't been destroyed. And so in some cases, they found grave markers. And you can see that's a, you know, a sort of semicircle of water-worn uh, stones that are placed around the, uh, the grave. And then this is you know, archaeo speak. You can see the different uh, color soils. This is where the grave shaft was. And then this is the subsoil into which that grave shaft was dug. Um, I, this is a photo of a skeleton of a woman who was in her 30s. This is a, a pointer pointing at a musket bolt, which is embedded in her uh, abdomen. And this up here <coughs> is a photograph of another skeleton. These skeletons were both photographed in the ground. And this is, again, the skeleton of a woman. These, this, these are hip bones. Do you see, do you see that? And then over here is an infant. Can you see that? Presumably she and the infant died in childbirth. But, you know, and there they are. So it, as I mentioned before, in my opinion, the African burial ground is the most significant urban site ever excavated in the United States. And this is true for many reasons. First of all, it provided enormous insight into the lives of the city's enslaved Africans in the 18th century, a population that is not well documented in historical sources. But even more importantly, it helped to reshape the, natu the national discourse on race in, in the United States, which had minimized the existence of slavery in the North and the deep historical presence of African Americans there. The conventional wisdom was that slavery was something that happened in the South. 
The burial ground's discovery and its tangible presence underlies the fact that enslaved Africans arrived here just a few years after the founding of New Amsterdam, and that throughout the 18th century, Africans made up almost one-fifth of the city's population. Today, there is both a museum and a memorial on the site of the African burial ground, and I recommend them both. How many people have been to that? You're excellent. I went to see Was it ceremony when so so you've been a you've followed the, the okay but you've been aware of the project all along that's great okay now what I'm going to do is hand the microphone over to Nan except there's no microphone <laughs> so we'll focus on some of some other parts of our book including looking at American cities through both a micro and a macro lens and also introduce you to a project we're currently working on yes okay. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about two different kinds of things tonight. Um, one relates to archaeological deposits that provide information on urban workplaces, <coughs> and the other about insights that urban archaeology has provided uh, that give us some sense of race, class, gender, and ethnicity uh, in America. I mean, it goes without saying that the nature of trade commerce, manufacturing, and service industries changed dramatically from the colonial to the post-colonial period. And um, archaeology has offered some interesting bits of information about each of these elements. But I'm going to begin with an example uh, of how the archaeological record can reveal illegal transactions. Um, this is on the micro scale. Uh, in some ways, to me, one of the more interesting aspects of what we do. Um, at an excavation in Fort Orange, no, the one on the right, in Fort Orange, or uh, what is now Albany, uh, that dates to the mid 18th century, Elizabeth Pena um, recovered information um, and a lot of deposits of wampum. Uh, some of them from the Dutch Reformed Church Alms House. Um, and there were also soldiers who were living in barracks nearby who were apparently also making wampum. Uh, now, what you need to know is that uh, the British who were in charge during this time period had said that wampum was not legal as an exchange medium. So the question is why was it being manufactured? Um, uh, Pena wondered whether the beads were being used, she suggested, that they might have been used in an illegal trade with the French who were in the north, and the French would have been using them to get furs from indigenous people, and of course the French and the British were in constant competition over who was going to get these furs. Another of archaeology's strength is in recovering information um, about the lives of undocumented people particularly the poor, and some of them are those who lived in almshouses. A number of excavations have provided data on the production of clothing, uh, often done by the poor. In Philadelphia, New York, and San Francisco, uh, clothing remnants were found uh, surprisingly well-preserved, uh, often in privies. And in the 19th century, uh, they revealed the organization of different kinds of production affiliated with different ethnic groups. Um, so in San Francisco, it was Scottish people, Jews, and the Irish who were producing this clothing. And in New York, it was mostly Jews and Irish. Um, among the Irish, it was the women who did the rag collecting and the sewing. But in Jewish families, um, the family worked as a unit, um, making clothing and then uh, opening shops. Um, so archaeologist Rebecca Yeaman noted that the Jews appeared to be quite frugal, um, investing their money back into the shops and in land, um, while the Irish seemed to have more of an interest, at least in terms of what was found in their homes, of having nice decorative objects. <clears throat> I, I have a long-term uh, interest in the provisioning of cities. Oops, gee. <laughs> Uh, through markets, 
um, several years ago using a macro approach, I mapped the distribution of markets uh, over a variety of time periods from the colonial to the post-colonial, and this is 17, uh, 1728, and this is uh, 1855, I think. Um, but in any case, uh, markets initially were along the East River um, in the colonial period, and then a bit, little bit later in that period, uh, they were still along the East River, but they get, began to specialize. Um, some of them have, having focusing on meat and others on fish, along with other kinds of products. Um, uh, but they were laid out so that really everybody could get to a market within less than half a mile of walking. This was a walking city. Um, in the mid-18th century, there were eight markets for 13,000 people. And by the early 19th century, there were eight markets for 96,000 people. So obviously not everybody would have the same access to markets in that time period. And I think this connects to the development of the working class and the hierarchy of convenience that privileges the developing elite. There's also a link uh, with markets to the creation of the grid plan in 1807 to 11, uh, which proposed central markets. Um, and ultimately, of course, we have the system of wholesale and retail markets uh, that persisted through the 20th century. And today, of course, we have a return to local markets, green markets, um, and we have other food distribution systems, which I will not go into because they're not archaeological. Now I'd like to uh, consider another important um, urban institution, taverns. And um, as you know, they were crucial during colonial times, uh, providing places of meeting, uh, accommodations for travelers, and uh, serving a range of other activities. Uh, Diana and I, a number of years ago, um, compared the assemblages from four colonial taverns, one in New York, the King's House, one in Jamestown, <coughs> one in a small rural town in Maine, and then the last one was in Massachusetts, the Wealthy Tavern, which apparently uh, was used by whalers. We thought, our hypothesis was that if a tavern's function was primarily providing accommodation and meals, then it would have a majority of ceramics in its archaeological assemblage. But if it was really mostly a meeting place that people would come to and then they would leave and eat elsewhere, that there would be mostly a predominance of smoking pipes. And so I think this slide illustrates very neatly uh, the range from the most urban to the very rural on the other end, where uh, they were clearly providing food to people who were either visiting or staying there overnight. Whereas in Jamestown and, and New York, the urban places, people were gathering there for socialization, information exchange, and smoking their pipes. Um, one of my favorite examples of 19th century worker practice comes from Massachusetts. Oops. Um, and the Russell Cutlery in the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, Michael Massini reports on the excavation of the mid-19th century Russell Cutlery Company, uh, which apparently produced excellent chisels and knives. Uh, the company shifted from <coughs> intensive hand production to a more mechanized production, um, which required less skilled labor in the 1870s. When archaeologists excavated the riverbank dating to that time, they found hundreds of cutlery rejects and broken mm -hmm. knives, and they wondered why they had been discarded. Um, Nassany and his colleague were actually able to talk to um, some of the people who had worked there. They must have been pretty old by this time, but, um, and they, who acknowledged throwing out imperfect knives so that they didn't have to redo them. Um, and uh, he and his co-author speculate that this is a a proletarian act of defiance, and that because the workers were mostly related to one another, they wouldn't have tattled on each other when they were doing this. Now let me turn to the social factors that structure urban lives, race, ethnicity, gender, class. These are all um, interconnected, of course, and can be seen archeologically, both at the macro scale of social geography, 
and at the micro scale where we have details of how people in these categories, however they're defined, were using material culture, at least in part, uh, for self-definition. <coughs> um, at, the, at the macro scale, excuse me a second, um, we can see that spatial and social aspects of life are recursively integrated and a recurrent pattern that shows up in excavations in places like St. Louis, Louisville, Kentucky, New Brunswick, shows a middle to upper class community uh, that when a uh, <coughs> factory or a railroad depot moves in, um, is transformed, the people who live there move away and the housing is then subdivided and occupied by a series of immigrant groups and then finally by usually African-American urban poor um, and sometimes finally uh, subject to urban renewal. Um, most archeological uh, research on social identity, however, exists at the micro level and archeologists have tested some theoretical ideas about the uses of material culture. How do we furnish our homes? And do we buy things that reflect who we think we are or who we want somebody to think we are? Um, so we have a lot of theoretical ideas about the uses of material culture as identifiers of social categories. And I would say that the primary conclusion is probably that in each case, different objects are being involved. There isn't any sort of pan, you know, across the country object that <coughs> establishes identity. Uh, race or ethnicity and class intersect in very complex ways in, with consumer choices in domestic settings. Uh, much interest has focused on African Americans, particularly in the 19th century, uh, although Diana spoke about the uh, African burial ground in the 18th, city, 18th century. Um, an archeologist named Paul Mullins focuses on African American consumption, and he says, well, their choices really, they wanted a comfortable home and they wanted to avoid discrimination. And so their purchasing was political as well as economic. Um, and they were not simply imitating white practice. Uh, and there are cities such as Annapolis, uh, Boston, Mobile, Alabama, uh, and Sacramento and Oakland and California, uh, which they show there are deposits from middle class or lower class African American homes, and they show the variability uh, of purchases of things like dishes and, and direct decorative objects and also in meat choices. African Americans tend to prefer beef and the Irish usually had a preference for pork. Um, a number of the archeological reports on African American homes come from middle class ones and I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about um, a project called <coughs> Seneca Village which Diana and I excavated about four years ago. It's in what is now Central Park um, and this is the outline of the area. And this is, um, this is Seneca Village itself. So you can see that the houses were all mapped in the 1850s. Before they evicted people in order to build a park, they had to map them and they had to you know, pay them, reimburse them. Um, so uh, it was, one of the things that's really interesting about this community was that it was a middle class African-American community. Um, and we found the remains of um, a house that had been lived in by a sexton um, for one of the three churches in the community. This is the outline of the house. Um, and that shows you all of the test cuts that we excavated. And then we also found uh, a backyard deposit that was associated with these two houses here. So we have a lot of material from this middle class community. What street level are we at? It's about 85th Street. And, on, and close to 8th Avenue. Uh, I mean, the village actually extended from about 87, 82nd to 87th, but the, the main drag was sort of 85th Street. Um, Diana has written elsewhere about the language of dishes, and while we've not totally finished the site report, it looks as though, unlike white families who tended to buy matched sets of dishes um, and separate tea sets, uh, the people in Seneca Village were buying dishes that were of the same general 
um, ceramic type and in the same color, but they had individual patterns so that the dishes didn't match. And this is, it has been suggested that this is left over from the period of enslavement when an expression of individuality was an attempt to resist the <coughs> oppression and, and the you know, elimination of individuality in, um, uh, when, by the masters of the slaves. So um, in other words, these people, each person had his or her own plate, which they would use at dinner. Um, the, the, and this finding has occurred in some other places as well. And uh, we also find uh, from these uh, African-American excavations, we can find information on um, medical practices, on disease. And for the middle class, we find a particular emphasis on the importance of education, slate pencils and things like that. I wish I had time to talk more about the archaeology of some of the Chinese Americans and the Irish Americans um, and Jewish people uh, who've all had excavations of some of their remains. Uh, the, uh, until recently, uh, the archaeology of Chinese <coughs> Americans focused on their sort of difference, their orientalness, but recently some people have demonstrated that there's a surprising amount of uh, interaction in material culture between European Americans and Chinese. Um, there's also some interesting research that's been conducted on Irish immigrants, particularly um, on their um, medical uh, problems. Um, Meredith Lynn notes that Irish who had typhus fever were regarded as dangerous outsiders, um, whereas if you were Irish and you had tuberculosis, you were seen as vulnerable and refined, and you were welcomed into American society. So the, the type of disease that you get, had totally randomly affected how people perceived you. When gender and class are integrated into the mix of social classifications, ceramics play a particularly significant role in, in disentangling attitudes. Um, uh, the Pretzelises in California described the white middle class as, in the mid 19th century, as using dishes, specific patterns as markers of gentility. Um, although I think it's interesting that some middle class African Americans had the same dishes. Uh, working class families from a number of different locations seem to have developed similar tastes to one another. Um, and I don't know if this, we don't know if this implies uh, the formation of a shared working class identity. But we think this is one that holds a uh, great potential for further uh, archaeological investigation. Archaeologists have also been able to offer information that has to do with gender, both among men and women. But one particularly frequent kind of excavation is that of brothels. And in the mid 19th century, there were a lot of brothels in urban areas, and they were quite varied. And, and some of the archaeological deposits have been able to distinguish between front door deposits and back door deposits. Mm -hmm. And the front door deposits show where the, uh, the visitors to the brothel who, had, you know, who ate very well and were served on very nice china, um, that's their, that, those are their deposits. And the backyard deposits show the lives of the young women who worked in these places. Um, and uh, the backyard deposits show a lot of medical treatments, um, efforts at maintaining hygiene, and in one particularly sad um, uh, brothel in New York, there were three infants that were in the privy. So I will conclude by saying that when we started this project, uh, Diana and I were worried about whether we would have enough material. Mm -hmm. uh, we ended up with a lot. Um, and we've tried to show in the book how archaeologists across the country have produced insights into many aspects of urban life. At the macro scale, when we look at the city as an artifact, we notice the ubiquity of the grid plan and its you know, deformations and malformations. We see the changing social geography, um, that accompanies immigration, class formation, ethnic and racial clusters. 
and we see the consistent uh, effects of commodification of land with the introduction of industry into formerly nice neighborhoods and the way uh, people move. And, and also, as the city grows, uh, land patterns change dramatically. We think that creolization and, and the formation of new groups, ethnogenesis, uh, found in, in many parts of America is really seen at the micro scale with the kinds of things that archaeologists find all the time. Broken pottery, broken glassware, uh, food remains, um, and other domestic objects. And um, we think now that there is likely to be more work with descended communities, African Americans, Native Americans, and others. Um, and we believe that archaeologists are now in a position to, to think more broadly and comparatively, um, to, to look at other settler colonies and see what does it mean to be American? You know, what, is a, what do our material remains look like compared to those in Australia or those in Canada? Um, is there a significant signature of working class identity or any other class identity? And so we are looking forward to investigating questions like this and others um, as we go forward. Thank you very much. Yeah. You should probably come up here in case there are questions. Are there questions? In the case of the uh, Stat House site, it is uh, now a privately built uh, office building. So I was wondering if what was the government's involvement that triggered the archaeology? Um, the Stathouse excavation was unusual for the ones that have taken place in New York in that it was a test case. It was something that the, the Landmarks Preservation Commission sponsored because they wanted to be sure uh, that they, they wanted to be able to show that there were, in fact, ar important archaeological deposits that could be found in the Wall Street District. Well, it and it turned out that they had a lien. They had a yeah. lien on the property <laughs> because uh, the, a landmark structure had been torn down there in the late 1960s. The idea was to reconstruct the facade of that building they tore down somewhere else. Uh, when they went to look for the remains of the building, I, this is the part of the story I love, They'd lost part of it. They could, they could, in other words, they couldn't find it. They wouldn't be able to reconstruct it. And also, preservation philosophy had changed. So, you know, reconstructing buildings outside of their original context is something that's frowned on. But this today. was also the block on which the Dutch town hall had been located. And so there was some incentive to do archaeology to see if it was still there. Is that but what was the incentive for the private owner to do it? He needed to be able to get a certificate of occupancy from the building, uh, for the building once they finished the building. In order to do that, they couldn't have liens on it by city by from city agencies like the Landmarks Preservation Commission. So that when he bought the property, they had they had to they had to declassify, declassify it. right. Uh, but the building that was lost was a much later building. Absolutely. Right. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't exact equality, this equals that. It was just the idea. And so that was why they sponsored it. We were very nervous when we started with that excavation that we wouldn't find anything, mm -hmm. and then there'd never be any archaeology. And then after that, it would be our fault. <laughs> Is that where they have the flexibility? Yes, yes. And they don't really but, keep but, it up. But Sandy <laughs> destroyed it. I mean, well, it, I mean, there, we had uh, photographs underneath the plexiglass in there, and I don't think anybody, I don't it, know, it, it, like anybody pays attention to it anymore. The photographs haven't been replaced? No. And there also has all sorts of vegetable and animal life growing <laughs> inside the <laughs> display cases, yeah. Uh, with all the current construction taking place in Lower in the Wall Street area, and I noticed many new buildings uh, in the process. What takes place uh, to confirm that there may or may not be any fines there? Well, hopefully what happens is that if they are not building an as-of-right building, 
if they're getting a special permit or buying air rights or doing this, that, and the other thing. If, uh, if they're not building an as of right building, the whole building comes under environmental review. And one of the things that they should look at is uh, an archeological site. But it's, it's monitored by the Landmarks Commission. And if they're building an as of right building, they don't have to do anything. And if they're not building an as of right building, the first thing that the Landmarks Preservation Commission would do is to ask them to do an historical study of the property to see what kind of sites could be there, like what we were talking about for the African burial ground, and then to also come up with a statement as to how likely it is that there could be a site preserved in the ground, an important one. Uh, but you know, we have to remember this is New York, and real estate is king. You know, so sometimes there's wiggle room, you know, for her. So I don't, yeah, I haven't, You would, you would think with the history that exists from the 1700s, 1600s, and it was all focused, down here, that there would be uh, interesting finds. Yes. Almost anywhere. Yes. yes. Well, but it could also be that there were buildings with deep basements that actually, you know, that really destroyed the archaeological site, as they thought at the uh, yeah. African burial ground. Yeah. Yes. What does as of right mean? What you're allowed to do just because you own the land. In other words, you're within Without all getting the zoning any requirements. Do you see what I mean? You don't have to get a special permit or, or waive a regulation or something like that. You have a right to do it. Mm -hmm. I always I have the image. If you if uh, if you were building an as of right building, you could build on the site of King Tut's tomb. tomb. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in terms of the regulations as they exist today, nothing would be done about it. They would presumably be like to think something would. <laughs> you had your hand up, sorry. Yeah, um, we, we focus the talk tonight on New York. How much of your book focuses on New York and then uh, how many other American cities uh, situations are, are covered in your book? I'm just curious. I don't know the number. I mean, we we very consciously tried not to focus on New York because we didn't want it to be a book about New York. So we have some uh, because that's where we worked. But we have a lot of material from Boston, Phoenix, Tucson, San Francisco, St. Louis. Um, you know, I mean, there's a there's an amazing cemetery in Tucson that was excavated that had thousands and thousands of uh, burials from the uh, 18th and 19th century. There are some great projects in the Bay Area that have uh, been going on for years and years that have amazing archaeology. So there's a lot, I, we think. Yes? And do any of those cities that you mentioned have stronger archaeological laws than New York? Mm -hmm. Probably. Yeah, I would say, yeah, we'll look at Alexandria, which is oh, a yeah. small city, but it is a city. They have a very um, strong uh, preservation and archaeological exploration. And Santa Fe, for example, has very good preservation laws, whereas Albuquerque has almost none, or just started recently being interested in that aspect of their community. So it's quite variable. Yeah. yeah. I think that, that raises the question about the um, what uh, what government questions are you asked to respond to? You know, is the, is the brief from the respective governments, are they asking good questions? Or can the academic side of you, of, the, of your you know, project, inform better questions that, uh, that the regulatory entities uh, you know, force people to, uh, to consider? Well, there are a lot of archaeologists work at the federal level and the state level, so they are the, the, the state historic preservation officers. And are you satisfied with the questions that you, you know? The kind of sometimes, I mean, I think list of EIS. I think concerns. that um, there's an unfortunate tendency for people to think that if it's from the 19th century, that you don't need archaeology because everything is so well documented. Mm -hmm. And we don't agree with that, but that, you know, people say it's so expensive to do archaeology and if it was used deposits for the 19th century, we don't really want to pay for it. Mm -hmm. But most agencies that deal a lot with real estate and stuff like that have someone on uh, staff who's an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. It helps them do that. And the thing is, the, the, uh, the regulations are so vague, like for the historic 
Preservation Act is the, being able to get information mm -hmm. about the past. I mean, it's like, oh. <laughs> so you can build a case in many different ways. Mm -hmm. and but there must be a standard from, that's required by the state or the federal government. So it's a, a list of questions that you must answer so that you don't get a $200 survey instead of a $200,000 well, survey. They, <laughs> every project would have a call for proposals in our or a so, but there isn't a standard. And that would be looked over by the overseen, the archaeologists and so forth, and the overseen agency. I don't want to make this really sort of optimistic. Make sure everything is perfect, because believe me. <laughs> yes? Is there an archaeology a, a study in college? Or like in an architecture a, like school a real and they have a degree in it or something? No. Like uh, anthropology. Years ago, historic preservation. And the in the United States is people mostly it's just anthropology. People who, anthropology. Who do it. There's no licensing or anything or school. There is some licensees. No. They have to have advanced degrees. Uh, you know, at least a master's to do to work on the, not to work in the projects, but to be a principal investigator. Or master's degree in what? Huh? In anthropology oh, or archaeology or archaeology or history. Yeah. Those would be the Do you work for architecture firms or are you independent? <coughs> there are all kinds of arrangements. I mean, some work for engineering firms, some mm -hmm. work for architectural firms, some are freelance. Some are mom and pops and they get contracts, you know, with the engineering firms or developers directly. And there's this problem with the archaeology, and some of you may have guessed it already, is that when you're doing this kind of contract archaeology project, your bills are being paid for by the person who wants you to find nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like, oh. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. And it may be indirect, you know, from the developer to an engineering firm, and then, you know, you're the sub-sub-subcontract, but ultimately it's the same thing. So that could be a problem. Sometimes you're given a time limit also. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, the, you know, we've had situations of fighting for more time and succeeding. Mm -hmm. We've also had situations <laughs> of not succeeding. <laughs> we had one project at Hanover Square where we were allowed to work until a certain date, and they showed up at 5 o'clock, and we said, the day doesn't end at 5 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> of the African burial ground? It's between, is it Reed and Dwayne Street yeah. on Broadway? Oh, okay. And the right. easternmost street is Elk Street, my favorite name. Oh, yes. I used to think it was for the animal, but it's for the fraternal order. Oh, <laughs> okay. yeah, it's between Broadway and Center. It's in between. Oh. It's right behind that where you pay your taxes. And, if, you, and if you're going there, uh, it's like getting on an airplane. If you're, if you're going there, they have to, uh, to the museum, they have security. So you have to, you know, not bring your pocket knife or whatever. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> in your view, how does New York City do in telling this history of... Not Indians? very well. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to expand on that? <laughs> well, the question, you know, is who, who, who does tell it? Yeah. And we try to tell it, but we're not educators. We're not, uh, you know, we write books, and a lot of them are sort of academic. And that's pretty boring. We are, we are trying. Um, there's been a lot of interest in Seneca Village. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we think is really important is to get its story into the New York City school curriculum mm -hmm. at the fourth grade and the seventh grade level. Mm -hmm. And there have been, uh, there was a play done recently in New Jersey about Seneca Village. And there have been a number, a couple of children's books written about well, it. There was the New York Historical Society exhibition. Yes, right. that was right. Are there markers in Central Park? There, there's a green sign, there's a single <laughs> green sign. But however, they're talking about doing more now. They see the yeah. conservancy more seems that more, but also more about uh, yes. having to be a presence in the park. Mm -hmm. But you know, how it will be done, we don't know. So. Any other questions? Well, we do have a um, wine reception, and although we don't have books to sign, um, we have the authors who can ask your individual questions. So um, we want to thank you very much, Diana. If you haven't been here before, I'm Carol Willis. I'm the founder and director of the Skyscraper Museum. And every
month, we do a, a book talk uh, as well as other programs that celebrate uh, either the history of New York City in general, of high rise development, uh, and th all things skyscrapers. So uh, the topics that we've been looking at in particular over this last year that um, celebrates the 50th anniversary of the landmarks, the founding of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, have focused in particular about uh, discovering New York, whether they're guidebooks uh, to some of the city's built environment, uh, or photographic collections of lovers and admirers of the city. Uh, and so it's, um, it's a delight to go deeper, to dig deeper tonight underneath the surface of the city, uh, and to think about the relationship of um, the, the the layers of the city's history, and also the way that we very often encounter it, uh, which is when, when uh, high-rise development is well is planned for a, for a place. The requisite public review process requires an environmental impact statement, which includes uh, investigations of uh, the, pre the previous history of the site. Uh, so actually a, a kind of um, industry of archaeology has been created uh, that has really forged a, a wonderful um, body of knowledge for uh, about the urban past. And this is particularly true of New York because New York has such an incredibly rich past of layers of, um, of um, sediment of, of, of civilizations um, and of building enterprises on the site, and especially here in Lower Manhattan. So the investigations of our speakers tonight with respect to downtown, as well as the broad academic uh, um, discipline of urban archaeology, uh, I, I think are going to be our topic, as it's been previewed um, a little bit from looking at the slides. but. Um, we certainly encourage uh, you that, to ask questions that, you know, that may be particular points of interest, but I think we'll weave in between the specifics of, of downtown New York's history and the broader academic discipline. I know some of you are, are colleagues, and so we, we welcome um, the questions at, at all levels. So let me just introduce um, Nan Rothschild and, and Diana Wall um, by mentioning some of their books and their, uh, their uh, um, sort of elevated uh, uh, academic um, uh, credentials at, the, at their respective universities. So uh, Nan Rothschild is the director of the Museum Studies Program um, at the Barnard College and Columbia University. Uh, she is also a professor of anthropology and is the author of three books, including New York City's Neighborhoods, the 18th Century, uh, and well, and two others that aren't on the back, <laughs> that aren't mentioned on the, uh, on the, the back cover of uh, this book. Um, and Diana Di Zarego Wall is a professor of anthropology at um, City College uh, of CUNY and is the author of The Archaeology of Gender uh, and the co author of the book Unearthing Gotham. So their um, experience really is, a, it has, is incredible wealth of um, intimate knowledge of, of New York City's history, and as I said, this uh, broad overview. So uh, this particular book is a textbook, The Archaeology well, of Sorts, The Archaeology of American Cities, that does take a broad overview. Uh, and um, as it happens, uh, the, our timing is bad, but as you, uh, in terms of the paperback being available, it won't be out until next month or the beginning of, of December, but you do have that sheet on your chair, so you will, you will be able, if you buy it through the publisher, um, to, be able to get a, um, a discount on, on that volume. Uh, we, of course, will carry it in our bookstore when it, when it does appear, uh, but um, for tonight, this is the single volume available. So, um, have you decided who's going to take it? I got first. You may examine it here. So, this is Diana. <laughs> Hi, yes, 